Hello, this is Dr. Naranicki from the Millis Institute at Christian Heritage College and this week we are looking at T.S. Eliot's uh, The Wasteland. I think uh, one of the reasons why we, we chose this particular reading uh, for this particular week um, has something to do with the general feeling of unease uh, that we are all going through as a result of the global pandemic. Um, so the last few readings of this semester all play into uh, a, this theme of unease and, and change and, and, and uh, uh, a, a sense of one kind of way of being coming to an end. Um, so in that sense, there's something therapeutic about these readings. They are uh, intended to have a, 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 a therapeutic as, as well as a uh, uh, intellectual benefit. Um, and I think the advantage of looking at just one poem for a whole particular week, T.S. Eliot's poem, The Wasteland, is that this particular poem deserves that particular attention. Uh, it's not the case that you can really, well, it's not the case at all that you, that you can rush through it. That you can just get through a bunch of T.S. Eliot's poems in, uh, in, in, in a three-hour uh, Socratic lecture period. Um, it, it doesn't work like that. It, it, it's, uh, it's, it, it's not like Emily Dickinson or, or, or even, even uh, the, the British Romantic poets that you can kind of... Uh, you can get through quite a few of them. It doesn't matter exactly which poems you pick. You just pick a few and we go through them. With this particular work, uh, uh, The Wasteland, it is itself a, a kind of grand architecture. Uh, it has something of the... Uh, so, there's something grand about this particular poem that deserves time, attention, uh, readings, re-readings, uh, attention to, to every single word, as well as a way, in, in, in one sense you want to read it, focusing on every single word he picks at, he, he chooses, and why he chooses. And then uh, other times you probably want to read it without paying any attention to it, and just letting the rhythm and cadence wash over you, in a way. There's something very melodic about T.S. Eliot, and uh, that that melodic quality really does come out in in la, uh, in, in, in when, when you do a, a, a reading out loud um, so that that's so in in this week's lecture we are going to do out loud readings of it um, and and this is something uh, he dedicated his poem to to Ezra pound and and Ezra really was one of the first people to pick up on this the the melodic quality of well I don't even think melodic is the right word there's a kind of rhythm a, a cadence uh, going through it I, I think rhythm uh, uh, is, is a better sort of uh, word for it. you feel like you are in motion moving forward and some poets have this to a high degree I think Goethe, reading Goethe in German, he has that, and he's he's an expert at manipulating that. Um, and Eliot also has his own kind of inner, you might want to call it an inner melody, an inner song, song, because externally there's, there's, you don't really get it. You don't there, there's no melodic melodic sort of sense. There's no traditional rhyme scheme and all of that kind of thing that's all thrown out. So me, the the m melody or the rhythm isn't driven. Uh, by outward traditional conventional forms like rhyme and meter. It's driven in, in, in another way altogether, um, which is why which is why he needs to be read out loud um, and why we need, you need to spend a bit of time on him to get a sense of the, the, uh, to get a sense of the voice. And sometimes it also helps, I think, to listen to a, 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 a professional actor, not what I mean by a professional actor, say uh, a, a Shakespearean actor, a real thespian reading uh, 
at T.S. Eliot's The, the Wasteland to get a sense of how how uh, uh, it, it should be read. Um, and, and then that kind of, uh, that inner movement, that inner vitality, um, that inner, f that flow uh, comes, it can come to the fore if you, if you hear it read well. Um, so, uh, one thing I like to mention about T.S. Eliot that's important to understanding his, his work is that this particular work was written while he was in the midst of a, of a nervous breakdown of sorts. Uh, his mental health was suffering uh, at this point to a considerable, considerable ex extent. Uh, his personal life was, was also uh, suffering and sort of falling apart in, in various different ways, including his, his marriage and that kind of thing. So, so we, have a, we, we have a sense that his, his personal psychological state is, 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 is laid bare on the page. Uh, and this way, even though it's a poem, it shares much with the, the, the Christian tradition of, of, of Augustine and, and, and the confessional tradition. Um, so there is something of the, the, the confessional in, in this, that he is, he is he's not, he's not hiding in uh, his, his, his angst, his mental instability, his anxiety. He, uh, uh, he's not hiding it as something that is shameful, but he's presenting it on the page and saying in a way that this is not just me, this is all, all of us, everyone in Western society after the First World War is experiencing something like this to a certain extent. And by putting words to it, he is, and putting it in poem form, He's, he's, he's giving expression or helping people identify and notice something that they are feeling but perhaps weren't able to notice and pinpoint um, and, until, until, this, until reading this poem. Uh, that's the beauty of po poetry and literature generally. It helps people pinpoint emotions that they are perhaps feeling but are not able to discern or name or give form to um, so that's so in that sense his personal his personal psychological state uh, becomes representative of a broader uh, social psychology so called social malaise social anxiety social depression that that all members of of, of the western world uh, were feeling uh, after the First World War in Europe, as a result of the uh, the, the sheer carnage and, and destruction of that 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 event, um, so it was a psychological trauma, pretty much, um, as as well as a phys a massive physical trauma. Uh, I've talked about before that just the, the 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 amount of lives lost, particularly young men of a whole generation. Some countries never recovered demographically from from that at all. But then the uh, psychological trauma that went along with that, um, then to be followed by the Great Depression and the rise of fascism, and then the Second World War, uh, leading some some scholars to, to, to refer to the First and Second World Wars as not two separate wars, but one giant war of sorts. Um, I can, the Second World War being a continuation, a finalization of the unfinished end or resolution to the First World War. Um, I don't know if I support that view, but at least it's important to sort of have uh, an appreciation of the fact that much of the 20th century was a traumatized century. Um, it was a horrific century, a century that, that, that kind of, almost in, in many ways, in, in indescribable. If, if you read some of the really good history books on it, like uh, Timothy Snyder's uh, uh, books, to, uh, books such as the Bloodlands. Okay, so basically, coming to terms with the the psychological trauma of the end of the First World War underpins underpins this uh, uh, this particular text. Uh, a lot, a lot, a loss of of faith in conventional uh, institutions. What was common uh, throughout this 
this period, uh, a loss of, of faith in, in the patriarchal um, organization of society around institutions and laws and, and the particular norms and uh, all of that. I mean, we saw, uh, yeah, so all, all, all of that is, is a, uh, I mean, compare this to, to last week's reading. Last week we, we looked at Virginia Woolf and her solution, her reaction, she reacted, she, it's very interesting to compare Virginia Woolf to T.S. Eliot because Virginia Woolf was reacting to the same sort of uh, so, social psychosis, you might want to say. Uh, she had her own uh, uh, mental health concerns um, uh, and, and, and traumas and instabilities anxiety, manic depression, aspects that look like schizophrenia. So she, she had uh, quite a few um, uh, psychiatric conditions as well that really uh, affect, affected her throughout her life. And um, her, her solution to, well, her reaction, not solution, her reaction was to, to the, the fallout of the First World War was basically, let's throw out all these uh, is, uh, the, 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 these institutions we have, or or at least let's reshape society on a on uh, in in a in a way that enables greater equality between the sexes. Um, uh, uh, that that's more critical of, of um, established conventions and hierarchies and norms. Uh, that that's kind of and she actually did in, in many ways a, a, a counter the, the the counterculture movement you could say she was one of the founders of that uh t.s Eliot, uh however his reaction was the opposite he saw uh in a, in a sense a complete breakdown of everything that was stable everything uh about society that ensures the, the stability of the society such that the individual can function uh, uh, normally, as an as, as an individual, without having all the, you know uh, a, an excessive amount of meta level sort of, sort of a, a existential and ontological angst and concerns that prohibits the, the individual from getting on with the business of leading their, their day to day lives, uh, and and for Eliot his solution was a a, a return to a, a a high Anglican or Anglo Catholicism. Um, religiosity uh, uh, a, a, a political conservatism um, and a monarchism as well and and the, these these three three aspects uh, uh, he, he took up um, and uh, saw as uh, uh, as perhaps uh, more than anything uh, uh, an avenue for for shoring up his his own worldview um, and, and he had a great, great concern with also, uh, saving what was, or salvaging, saving or salvaging, depends on how pessimistic you want to, you want to be, uh, what was left of Western civilization after the fall of the first, after, after the first world war. And it's interesting that he also lived after the second world war too. So, so his concern was, a, was an ongoing concern, um, and, and I think his, his, his viewpoints, his arguments are about, uh, about the, 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 the practical day-to-day -day function of, of conventions, norms and standards uh, uh, that un underpin uh, a civilization have, uh, have been taken up to, to a certain extent by, by um, uh, modern thinking conservatives such as Roger Scruton. So, uh, but when I say conservative, and we have to be very careful about this term because it's not it's not a popular conservatism at all, and it's not a a, a kind of a, a Western sort of chauvinism as well, uh, or ethnocentrism. We have to remember that T. S. Eliot, uh, I mean, he studied Sanskrit and Pali at university. Uh, his religiosity was expansive. Uh, his worldview was expansive. Uh, for for him, uh, I think it was the case that uh, by 
being sort of at home in a way in non-Western cultures, uh, particularly in, 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 uh, in, in the Buddhist and Hindu cultures, uh, he was able to see what was amiss or what was lacking in the West. Uh, and seeing that within the West's own repertoire, uh, the best way of finding a remedy for this would be to look to the, the Anglo-Catholic tradition. So it was something like that. That was his move to conservatism. That, that within our particular tradition, that was the, the, the move that would assure that uh, cultural sort of stability, longevity within the, 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 pos the, 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 um, the repertoire of beliefs and norms and institutions that we already have. Um, yeah. So he, so even though he was very well um, versed uh, in, 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 in Buddhist thought uh, for a Westerner of that time, uh, so he's someone who's versed in Western classical thought, uh, Greek and Latin, but then also having this Buddhist stuff. And he, he didn't say, no, let's all, become, let's all become Hindus or let's all become Buddhists now. This would repair society. No, no, no. Um, he, had that, he had that as, a, in, in a, as an important part of his own uh, uh, intellectual life. But he could see... Uh, He, it's almost like he, 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 he translated what was missing in, in, uh, in the West that he found in the Eastern spirituality back into uh, uh, what, what was already available in the Western spiritual and religious tradition uh, of Christianity. So we see a lot of play in, 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 his, uh, in this particular, the wasteland, uh, a play between... Uh, 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 sort of a Eastern Hindu and Buddhist uh, concepts and terms and words, uh, with 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 Western Christian concepts and terms and and uh, and, and, and uh, yeah. So so it's kind of there's kind of a almost a a, a, a kind of a. A project of translation, you might want to say, going on here. Uh, and he's not saying throughout the West, throughout Western, uh, Western spirituality, Western Christianity, uh, but he's saying, well, let's look to the East. Let's let's see what they have of value. And then, now with with this with this, you know, with these fresh eyes, now let's turn back to our tradition. And lo and behold, we have that already in our own tradition, whether it's the medieval monastic uh, mysticism, uh, whether it's uh, uh, in the ritual of, 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 of the high Catholic uh, uh, liturgy um, or Orthodox liturgy, uh, whether it is, it is in the very activity of, of, of Western pilgrimages, uh, it, 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 it's then kind of it. It, it's looking to it, it's looking to a part. He he was kind of someone who looked to a part of the world that wasn't as damaged as the West in order to see get a better sense of what indeed had the West lost. So uh, I I think in that and and that is why that he intersperses so much. Uh, non-English, I think, into this text as well. Uh, having the Pali there, having the Latin there, having, I mean, it, it, these kind of things, have, uh, have, having, having, the, having the German in there, having the Greek in there, I mean, it's all, it's, it, it's, it's, all, it's all part of showing, showing, okay, you need languages. Languages are essential to culture. Here are the languages. And even today, now that effectively Greek and Latin are almost completely lost in the university cu culture, I mean, very few universities teach Latin, teach ancient Greek, uh, that kind of very few academics are imbued in that culture. I think T.S. Eliot is, is someone who's saying, well, you know, giving value to, to that by putting that in, in, his, in his poem. 
Um, and then also saying, well, let's not be limited to that. Why, why not learn Pali or Sanskrit if you have the chance? I mean, it's interesting to know that, I mean, I, I always mention Karl Popper because I did my PhD on Karl Popper. Well, he learned Greek as a high school student and he spent his time uh, translating, translate in his old age when he returned back to Greek poetry. Well, he, he spent his old age translating some and, and creating some of the most beautiful uh, uh, renditions of, of of the works of Parmenides and, and uh, Xenophanes and other Greek pre-Socratic philosophers, um, the most beautiful poetic renditions of these that I've heard. Um, so here was Karl Popper, the famous philosopher of science, associated with science, epistemology, logic, and all this sort of stuff, well versed in that, that particular Greek culture to the such extent that he could teach it at the university level. Um, so we didn't really, I mean, we really don't have people like that in our civilization and culture anymore. And I think uh, T.S. Eliot is, it has, that, has that cultural capital, has that breadth, um, uh, has that richness, richness um, that I think it's, it's, it's yeah, it's, he's, he's worth reading to, to, to get a sense of, 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 the, of the level, of, of a level that kind of, um, uh, that you know, we you know, it's rarely seen. Um, okay, so that's the end of end, end of this part of the video. Um, uh, the next one will be focused on the more technical uh, aspects of uh, T.S. Eliot.